Lord. Romans chapter 12. You know, last week in our study, Paul exhorted us through his words in putting our faith to action, church. He spoke about putting that faith we have into action. And he spoke about using the gifts that God gives us. Use those gifts. You know, I mentioned uh, uh, the other day, well, let's read that in verse 6. In verse 6 in Romans 12, it says, Having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Paul saying, by golly, why don't you use those? And I said last week, why would you not want to use something that God's given you? If He's given you a gift of the Spirit, use it. Each Christian, Paul says, that each member of Jesus' church has a position. The Bible says we've all been all given a gift. One, two, half a dozen, whatever it is, you've been given a gift. And then Paul mentioned the fact that each member of Jesus' church has a position and all are necessary and all are important. I love that part. You know, it's not like the church is Pastor Dennis. It's not like the church is, you know, my wife or, or Mark. Or, no, the church is the body church. The church is the entire body. In fact, the church is not this building. We just happen to have a beautiful building come meet in. Amen? That's the church, the people. It's all necessary and important. All appointed, appointed by God, called by God in a sense, empowered by God's Holy Spirit. Those are the gifts of the Spirit. You're empowered by it. All, as it said, dealt out by God for His purpose. In verse 3, he says that God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Each Christian has been called by the will of God, church. I love that fact. By the will of God for a purpose, by the way. There is a purpose behind it. A purpose of God and for God. God's will, basically, being called to God's will. See, Paul knew this all too well for his life. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote there to the church in Corinth, in the very beginning, verse 1, 1 Corinthians, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Paul knew where his calling came from. Paul knew it all too well. In 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. It wasn't by the will of Paul. It wasn't by the will of some other disciple. It was by the will of God. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, not from man, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. An apostle, not by man. Guys, your calling is not by man. If God's given you a gift, it's not of man. It is of God. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. We're studying the book of Romans. It says right there, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated then to the gospel, the gospel of God. Paul knew, he knew where his calling came from. He knew it very well. And who empowered him for that calling? It was all from God. Paul knew that. Paul knew even the words. Guys, you got to understand this. God's holy word. Paul knew even the words he scribed down, he wrote, even the words he scribed down for his readers were not of him. They were of God. They were God-breathed. They were from God, the Holy Spirit. Each word that he writes is for a purpose and a purpose of God. Paul knew this, 2 Timothy 3.16, when he wrote to Timothy, he said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Not inspiration of Paul, not inspiration of, of you know, James or somebody, no. By inspiration of God and is profitable. That means, by the way, inspired by God, God breathed. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Guys, Paul's words in Romans are not his own. Do you understand that? They're not even Paul's word. They're but God's word. You know, Paul, just like the rest of us, see, he was just a man. He truly was a man. He was called by God, and there was a purpose for his life. But Paul, just like the rest of us, only had the wisdom that was given to him through God's spirit. In Proverbs 2.6, it says, For the Lord gives wisdom. Doesn't say Paul gives wisdom. Doesn't say man gives wisdom. The Lord gives wisdom. And from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Oh man, the more you dwell into God's word, the more you realize that for your life. That's where it comes from. 
So as we continue now, Paul, through the inspiration, right, the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, will write words of necessity for our Christian walk, church. And these words are going to be instructions in unity within the body. Very, very important that there is unity in the body. Instructions in just Christian living, you know, not necessarily within the church, but maybe out in the community with your neighbors. I want to say it's instructions in our behavior, how we behave. So let's pray, and I'm going to get into the, this morning's verses. Father God, we just thank you, going, Lord. I thank you again, the fact that, God, it is your words. It is your holy, inspired word, God. That Lord, man, man did not write this, Lord. You inspired man to pen it down. Put the, put the pen to the, to the paper, Lord. But God, truly, it is your inspired word. Teach us through your word this morning, Father. Show us what we need to hear for each of us, God. By the power of your word, in Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message this morning is, Are You Behaving? You know, I asked my grandson that, little Isaiah. He's in first grade now. Little Isaiah is in first grade, and I ask him, Are you behaving in school? Are you behaving? I look at my granddaughter over here. I can't ask her if she's behaving anymore because she's, she, she, never, she never behaves, so... You know how the person will say, uh, never mind? Well, she never minds either. <laughs> so are you behaving? In chapter 12, I want to just recap just a slight bit here. In chapter 12, so far, we have been begged, by the way, by God's Holy Spirit. It said, Paul, I beseech you, but God's Holy Spirit actually begged us to be a living sacrifice, right? To be that living sacrifice, not to conform to the world, church. Not to be a part of the world, to be separated from the world. He has, he has begged us then, last week we spoke about, to be humble. Not to set ourselves up on some high pedestal, to be humble also. And then he begged us also to use the gifts that God has given us. Use those gifts. Now we will read important instructions in our personal, I want to say our personal behavior, okay? That's why I named it, Are You Behaving? You need to adopt these attributes in your Christian walk so you don't misbehave, right? You don't misbehave. Verse 9, let's head off there. We're actually going to read all five verses, and then you know I got something to say about them. <laughs> Amen? Okay, verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, given to hospitality, a whole list of what I want to call behavioral encouragement. You understand that? It's an encouragement that Paul is giving us here. He's exhorting us. Remember, I told you last time I love those people who exhort. Those are those people who encourage others. He's encouraging us for this behavior. And I love where Paul starts. He starts there in verse 9. What does he start with? He starts with love. And he says, love without any hypocrisy, church. No, I kind of said that with a Spanish twang to it, rolled my R's, hypocrisy, no hypocrisy, guys, love with hypocrisy is not love anyway, right, love with hypocrisy is not love, true love must remain pure in our thought and pure in our heart, that's love, there can't be hypocrisy in love, to say you love the brethren, you must show it in true love, without hypocrisy, you know, for many Christians, they'll profess their love for their fellow Christian. Oh, I love that person, you know. They'll, but in the same breath, they'll speak ill of them. I love that person, but they throw the but in there. No, there, there doesn't need to be a but. You either love that person or you don't love that person. What is it, you know? Don't be hypocrite. I love that person, but I wish they'd change this way about them. But this, I wish they'd do this. Love with hypocrisy. You know, there's no such thing. 
You can't have love with hypocrisy. God says no. Guys, remember where I read there in James? You probably didn't turn there earlier. If you want to turn there now, you can. I'll read it again. I'm just going to read a portion of it. This is that, this is that you know, saying you love somebody, and then with, this, with the same breath saying, but, you know, can't stand this about him, right? <laughs> James chapter 3, verse 9. With it, this is the tongue, remember? Our mouth, our speech, what we're saying. With it, we bless our God and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. You know what that is? With the same tongue, we're doing that. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not be so. <laughs> James Wright. No, they're not to be so. That is not love. That is hypocritical love. In verse, second part of verse 9, it says to abhor what is evil. Abhor what is evil. Hate. That's what that means. Hate what is evil. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good, right? Hate what is evil. What is evil? Well, hypocrisy. <laughs> I'm telling you straight up. Hypocrisy. That's evil. We need, we need to abhor that, not, not have that in our lives. Hate that. What is good? Well, love. There we go. We got the two of them wrapped in there. You know, often, often for us, it's easier to do one or the other. You understand what I'm saying? It's easier to abhor evil or cling to what is good. It's either easier to hate what is evil or cling to what is good. I want to tell you, the mature Christian, the mature Christian knows how to practice both, guys, in unity. In unity. In love without hypocrisy. Seeing through Jesus' eyes. Knows how to practice both. In verse 10, we move on. It says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, phileo love. In the Greek, it would have been phileo love, brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. Kindly affectionate. Kindly affectionate. Phileo love, brotherly love. You know, in our English language, we only have the one word love. In the Greek, they had four different words for love. And one of those words was phileo love. That's the brotherly love. In our English language, we use this word love for everything, right? Well, I love my dog. I love my cat. I love my children. I love my wife. I love hamburgers and french fries. Are those all the same? Well, no. No. But see, in, in the Greek language, it was much more expressive. And Paul used the, the word phileo, brotherly love. See, there's four different words in the Greek. The first one was agape, agape love. Now, the guys, this is the love of God. This is the highest, highest of love. This is the love of our Savior being put upon a cross. God giving his only son upon a cross. That is that love. It's one we really will never add up to. Agape love of God. That agape love. Then there's storge. Storge love. That's Family love. That's the love of a mother for their child, the love of, of, a, of a dad for their child. That is that family love. Maybe siblings, but you know how siblings can be, right? But mainly a mother's love, I want to think, for their child. You know, guys, that's almost a, uh, what's the word I'm look unconditional type love. Guys, if you've ever had a child, a child that has been a prodigal child, oh, man. You keep wanting to love them. You keep wanting to help them. And sometimes, you, actually, you're hurting them, by the way. I've known many to do that. They'll enable a child by helping them, helping them once they become an adult, I'm saying. Once they become an adult, by helping them and helping them and, you know, bailing them out of jail and this and that. But the fact of the matter is that's storge love. Then there's eros love. Now, that's sexual love. That's intimacy between a husband and a wife. We would say making love. That is eros love. Then there's that phileo love, and that's that brotherly love. And that's what Paul is speaking about. The love of those within the body. Brotherly love. 
God says in his word, be kindly affectionate, showing brotherly love, showing brotherly love. You guys well know I'm a hugger, right? I give people hugs. I'm a hugger. If it's a guy, I'll, I'll give him a handshake and I'll pull him in for a hug. You know, some guys, they're huggers too, and they're, they're just huggers. Affectionate. Affection shown pure and holy, by the way. Pure and holy. With no hypocrisy, no hypocrisy in it, only brotherly love, phileo love. You know, um, in our world today, that affectionate love in our world today, that love of others so many times is looked at as wrong or nasty, you know? That you would, that you would hug a lady, that you would hug a child. You know, I get down on my knee there. When they're little like that, I get down on my knee and I, and I hug those children as they come in. And sometimes I may even give them a little peck on the cheek. Guys, that is affectionate, brotherly love. But the world today, oh, they can look at that and say, oh, that's wrong, that's nasty. Now, with you ladies, and you probably notice this, okay? You probably notice this. I do what you call a Calvary Chapel side hug, okay? With most of the ladies, I do a Calvary Chapel side hug. But sometimes a lady will do a frontal embrace on me. There is nothing nasty, nothing wrong with that church. It's affectionate, phileo love. The world says it's wrong. The world says it's wrong. You know, I, there's this little lady over here, little old lady. I love her. And, and she can't hardly see. And so every time I go see her, I go see her at her house. She'll give me a hug and she'll give me a little peck on the cheek. You know, I just love that. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, many cultures, that's very, very common. You know, when I was over, I went over to Iraq and in the uh, Islamic community, that's very common. They'll do it three times, actually, give you a, a kiss on the cheek. When I'd go to visit somebody at their house, I just went along with the culture, guys. <laughs> I let, them, let them kiss me on three times. I think in Italy, it's the same thing. Anyway, there's nothing. The problem's not the pure, affectionate love, you understand? The problem is the defiled minds of this world. That's the problem. Unbelieving and defiled minds, Titus 1.15. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. To those with the defiled minds and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and their consciences are defiled. See, there's the problem, church. It's the defiled minds of the world. Now, I understand I understand some of the apprehensions some have. Guys, we see it every day on the news. We see it every day on the TV. We may even know those. We may even know those where the defiled minds have had their way, those unbelieving defiled minds. I understand it. There's many defiled minds out there, right? The world is defiled. The world is defiled. But guys, I just got to tell you, as a church, please stay pure, kindly, affectionate to one another. It's very important. We are not of this world. Jesus says we're not of this world. By the way, in Romans, it's told, do not conform to the things of the world. Don't conform to that. Don't, don't put yourself in that, in that position where, gosh, it's wrong to, to give a, you know, a lady a hug or, or you women to give a man a hug. You know, you know when it's wrong in your own mind. Like I say, do the side hug. I think it works just fine, you know. But anyway, be kindly affectionate. You're not of this world, church. In verse 10, it also says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, that phileo love, in honor, giving preference to one another. Ah, oh, man, in honor. In honor, giving that preference to one another. Fulfilling Jesus' greatest commandment. You know what that is? That is filling Jesus' greatest commandment. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. Church, please, do that. Start there. Love God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. Love your Savior. He died upon a cross for you. Love Him. Love them. And then Jesus said, this is the first and great commandment. Yes, it is. And the second, though, is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In honor, giving preference to one another. 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, then, Jesus says, hangs all the law of the prophets. What he said is this is totally important. What I just told you. Everything of God's word lies on that right there. Love your neighbor as yourself. In honor, giving preference to one another. Philippians 2.4, I think I used Philippians last week. It says, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also of the interest of others. That's what that is. Giving preference to one another. Giving that preference. Putting their needs before yours. You know, just that simple. I realize that's not, well, that's not a human trait. Let's put it that way. That's not a normal trait. But guys, you're not of this world, you see? You're a new creation. Everything's changed about you. You're upside down compared to the way the world sees, right? Giving preference to one another. Showing their interest first. Verse 11. It says, not lagging in diligence. Oh, there's that word diligence again. Remember last week we had that word diligence? He says, not lagging in diligence, fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in the spirit, serving God. That word diligence. I love that word diligence. Guys, God wants his children to be diligent in the things of him. He wants you to be diligent. He wants you to persevere. I love that word too. My pastor used to always use that with me. Persevere, Dennis. Persevere. Okay, brother. Ah, thank you. Diligent though. Perseverance. Not only diligent, God says, not only diligent, but fervent in the spirit as you are diligent, right? With a passion. That's what that means. To have a passion. A passion about you as you are being diligent. Guys, I have a passion for God's word. I don't know if you can tell by the way I teach. I have a passion for God's word. I have a passion for teaching his word. Whatever God has gifted you in, have a fervent spirit about it. Have a passion about it. Do it with all you got. It doesn't matter what that gift is. It doesn't matter what that ministry you're in. Do it with all you got. Passion to it. Serving God. Serving God. Like I say, not only that we are, we are diligent, but we are fervent in being diligent. Doing what? Serving the Lord. That's what he says. Serving the Lord. Wherever you're serving the Lord. By the way, serving the Lord doesn't, just doesn't include being within these walls. You serve the Lord out there, church. Do it with passion. Do it with fervent spirit. Do it with your, your neighbor, your co-workers. Be fervent in spirit. Serving God. Guys, we can be so fervent and diligent about so many things in our lives, right? So many other things in our lives. I'm not looking at my wife when it call it coming down to Cardinals football games. No, I don't know why she's a Cardinal fan, but anyway, it's all good. It's all good. Oh, boy, I tell you what, she's pretty passionate about making sure she watches those games. She's pretty fervent in the fervent and I don't know, spirit necessarily. Diligent about it, too. We can be diligent and fervent in so many things. Oh, getting ready for that vacation. Man, I am diligently getting well, everything, putting it together, fervent in the spirit on it. Anything to do with self, you know. Or maybe you got you a new car. Boy, I fervently in the spirit with diligence. I wash it every week and polish that baby up. No, he says serving God. How about we put the same energy into serving God as we do other things in this world, church? How about that? Serving God in your sphere of influence. You know, the Lord gave me that. And he gave me that this week. Uh, a dear sister in the church texted me about a situation uh, that she's been ministering to with, a, with a, another lady and, and her son and stuff like that. And I spoke, I texted her back. I said, you know, God's put you, God has put them in your lives. That's your sphere of influence, you see. Each of us have a sphere of influence everywhere. I mean, whether it's 
Your neighbor next door, whether it's a family member, whether it's a co-worker, you have your sphere of influence. You serve God in that area, church, fervently, passionately. God will tell you what to speak. Don't get, don't get all riled up about it. Well, I can't minister to anybody. Yeah, you can. He's gifted you to do that. Seriously. God's given you gifts, and, and he wouldn't put you in front of somebody that you couldn't minister to. You know, there's many times we've gone through things in our lives, church, that maybe they were a trial, maybe they were a temptation, but those things have prepared us to speak to others. They've prepared us to speak to others in those same areas, or maybe you're going through something that you can speak to somebody else in. Serving them diligently. We've got to move on. Verse 12. Verse 12 and 13. Let's read them both here. Rejoice in hope. God says, rejoice in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints. Given to hospitality. Now, I'd like to kind of run these two verses together. And this is what God showed me, okay? I thought it was pretty cool. I want, to, I want to run these together on how we distribute to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. What are we to distribute? Well, God, God brought this in this way to me. I'd like to run them together. Through our behavior, church, what can we distribute to those through our behavior? Our behavior, I want to say, as mature Christians. I understand not everybody's at the same maturity level in Christianity. We start out as babies and we grow from there. But how do we um, distribute these needs as a mature Christian? Well, let's start out with uh, their rejoicing in hope. Rejoicing in hope. Distribute rejoicing in hope to those who need it, church. To those who need it. 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you the reason of the hope that is in you. That hope that you are to distribute among the saints, beyond among the saints, distributing those things. Guys, there's a lot of people in our community that need your rejoicing hope. It says right there, rejoicing in hope. They need your rejoicing hope. Trust me, I run into them every week. I try to give them that rejoicing hope. Distribute it, church. Don't hold it back for yourself. Give it away, you know? Give it away. Distribute it with hospitality even. With hospitality. Kindly giving it away. Like I say, well, there's some in the body. There's those in the body that sometimes just need a little of your rejoicing hope too. Maybe you're mature in your Christianity and you, you know how to trust God in faith and you got that, that rejoicing spirit in you, even through those trials. And they don't. Give it away. Distribute it to them. You understand where God took me here? Don't be stingy. Give away that rejoicing hope, church. Patient in tribulation now. He says also, patient in tribulation. Show the unbeliever and the believer alike your faith by persevering through trials with style. Church, seriously. That rhymes. Style, or trial with style. Persevere your trial with style, man. Show that unbeliever, show that believer alike. As you go through those trials, you got that joy. You got that joy through that trial. Take the attitude of James. James wrote this. Boy, I'd like to tear that page out of the Bible, right? Let's get rid of that one. James spoke this. James 1, chapter, uh, verse 2. It says there, My brethren, count it all joy. He says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You see what it's doing? It's producing, actually persevering the testing of your faith. He says, count it all joy. And literally, count it a blessing. Do you understand God's doing something? That's the greatest part. Hey, I'm not just, I'm just not this person out here. God's actually doing something. There's a trial in my life. There's a temptation in my life. 
I golly do it with style, church. Trusting the Lord, trusting God, knowing that God is, is doing a greater work in you. You know, on Wednesday night in 2 Samuel, I was speaking about uh, how, uh, how uh, Absalom set fire to uh, Joab's fields, right? It was to get his attention because he wasn't doing what he wanted them to do. So he lit his barley fields on fire. And I was telling him, giving an example, I said, man, that's the way God gets our attention sometimes. He puts a fire around us, man. All these fires start starting up and he gets our attention that way. <laughs> Count it a joy. Count it a blessing. Display your behavior as one who has trust and faith in God, church. Who has trust and faith. Distribute that faith, you see. Distribute it to others. How you, how you go through that. Your testimony can lift up that brother or sister. You know, many times God puts those people in front of you where your testimony is exactly that. You've been through it, or maybe you're even going through it. Boy, it's better off if you're going through it at that time. Because now you can do it with style, and that person there, that brother or sister, or maybe that non-believer, can go, wow, that's what it is to be a Christian, right? That's what it is. Go through it with style. And give it away. Give that away. With hospitality. <laughs> you know, Satan's got nothing on you, church. If you're a born-again believer, Satan's got nothing on you. Make sure you tell that person too. You're getting beat up. Satan ain't got nothing on you. All right, let's do this with style. I understand there are those trials in life that seem pretty bad. Physical ailments. Terminal cancer. Well, you want to do it with style? What greater healing can you have, church, than to go be with your Lord and Savior? Do that with style. I'm sorry. I know people that have had major, major, the one poor lady, I always mention her name, Joy, Joyce Free. Joyce Free went from one... Uh, Walking upright, she got MS really bad to on a cane, into a wheelchair, to just shriveling up. Man, that lady showed the joy in the Lord of her. Every time you seen her, she was concerned about, how are you doing? Wasn't about her. Wasn't about her at all. Do it with style. It says then, continuing steadfastly in prayer, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. <laughs> There's a good one. Distribute your prayers, church. Distribute them out. Give them away. Give them away with hospitality. Pray for others. You know, most people have a tendency to pray about their own needs. Their own needs first. Pray for others. Try that one. Don't pray about things for yourself. Don't worry about yourself. Jesus says don't worry about any of that stuff. Don't I take care of it all anyway? Pray for others. Distribute those. Distribute them with hospitality, too with loving kindness, I challenge you. I challenge you. Turn your prayer, your prayer life. There's nothing wrong with praying for yourself, church. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that by any means. But I challenge you. Turn your prayer life towards others and watch the blessings. Watch what God does in your own life. Give them away. Distribute those out there. Paul was one who prayed for other people constantly. Very few times do you see Paul praying for himself in the Word of God. He prayed for others constantly. Philemon, chapter 1, verse 4. It says, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers. As he spoke to that church, he wrote that letter to that church. He says, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Distributing those prayers, church, Giving them out. What moves the hand of God? Prayer, right? That moves the hand of God. Be praying for others. Be praying for that neighbor who's, who's a non-believer. Be praying for that lost person out there. Be praying for your enemies. Be praying for those who've wronged you. Be praying for the body of Christ. For the person sitting next to you. Distribute those prayers. Give them away. And then watch your blessings. Paul also said... In Ephesians 1.15, Therefore, 
I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul was a praying man, and he was praying for those churches, and he's praying for those Christians. You talk about some tribulations and some persecution coming upon the church. He was constantly praying for them. Distribute those prayers, church. Give them away with hospitality. And by the way, while you're doing that, would you send some up for myself and my wife, please? I covet your prayers. Please. Get, put those prayers towards me, too. And my dear, dear wife. She needs it. She's got to live with me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So how are we behaving, church? How are we behaving? Are you behaving? How are we behaving? Are you behaving like Christians that love one another? Seriously, think it out for your own self. Are you behaving with Christians that love one another? Loving without hypocrisy, right? Loving with no hypocrisy. Clinging to what is good. Hating what is evil. Hating your own sin, church, we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. Hating your own sin, we have to hate our sin, church. We have to hate what is evil. You know, when I sin about every six months, no, all the time, God's Spirit convicts me, and I hate it. I hate that sin, and I go before the Lord, and I say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for what I said. Forgive me for what I did. Forgive me for what I looked at, Lord. I hate it. It hurts. Guys, that'll tell you a lot about your maturity in Christ. When, when that Holy Spirit conviction hits you, and it's like, I have to go before the cross. I have to claim the blood of Jesus now because, man, I'm getting beat up here by God's Spirit, hating the sin in our lives. How are we doing? Are we behaving? Being kind and affectionate toward the brethren. Being kind and affectionate. Are we showing the love of Jesus also to our community? Seriously, man, we got... God, I want to say, Jesus is kicking tail and taking names. You notice I didn't use a profanity there, guys? Kicking tail and taking names in this community, and He truly is, little by little. God is doing a work. But are we, are we reaching out to our community in our sphere, sphere of influence? Each one of you have that. You have different people you know. Are we kindly affectionate, caring for the needs of others over ourselves? That's what it boils down to. Caring for those needs of others. How are we behaving, church? Are, are we behaving? Are we diligent serving the Lord? Are we diligent? Yeah, you got to ask it for yourselves. Fervent and passionate in serving, showing Jesus in everything we do. Oh, we have a passion and a fervency about it. Are we diligent? How are we behaving? Are you behaving? Are you rejoicing in hope through your trials and tribulation? Are you rejoicing in those hope? Are you patient? Are you patient in those trials and tribulations? persevering those trials. Like I say, with style, man. Do it with style. The world won't understand you. Trust me, the world. But the Christian will. They know what you... They know that hope that you're rejoicing in. Church, how are we doing? Are we rejoicing in our hope? Are we showing our faith? How are we behaving, church? Are we praying? Are we a church of prayer? Or you just lift up a prayer when things seem to be going wrong for you. You know, God, you need to help me here and help me there. And God, God, God. You know what? First thing you need to do when you pray to the Lord is you need to recognize who He is. You need to adore your Lord. Adoration. Love on God. Bless His name. Then confess your sin, church. You know what? Once you do that, those things of yourself will kind of go away. You know what I mean? They'll go away. How are we behaving? Are we praying? Or just behaving like mere men and women, church? Mere men and women. Carnal and immature in our walk with God. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians as I finish it up right here. 
1 Corinthians chapter 3. I think I used this maybe last week or the week before where Paul spoke to the church of Corinth. Oh, he uh, basically rebuked them. That's a good word, rebuked. He rebuked them for the way they were. Are we behaving? Are we behaving just like mere men and women? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but to as carnal, fleshly, as to babes in Christ, as to worldly people. I can't even speak to you that way. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you're not even able to receive it. And even now you are still not able Dude, he's rebuking them. They need some exclamation points there because he's, he's yelling at them. For you are still carnal, you're fleshly, you're worldly, he says. For where there are envy and strife and division among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Mere men and women, right? Church, you're a Christian. If you are a Christian, if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are a Christian washed by the precious blood of our Savior. Christians that are saved by, by grace through your belief, by faith. You're a Christian. You don't need to be just mere men, mere women, right? You don't need to be carnal. You don't need to be worldly. Are you behaving? Are you behaving like a Christian? I'm not saying just in here, by the way. Oh, we can all have on our Christian, Christian smile and speak our Christianese. Oh, God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. What do you like when you're out there? Are you dropping some of those nasty tongue things we talked about earlier? How are you out there? Guys, you look to the Word of God. As Christians, we look to the Word of God as the final authority in everything in this world, in our life, in, in I'll say it wrong, inerrant Word of God. Look at God's Word. You look at the world. You look at everything in your life through the lens of the Bible. We're Christians. So look at that as a final authority. Christians who are not to be conformed to the world. Amen? Don't be conformed. The Bible says be transformed. That's all the world wants to do. You know, when I taught on that, I don't know, it was last week, I think, just conform us, conform us, you know. And you remember what I said? It's, they'll say, well, you're not open-minded. You're just not open-minded. You're darn right you're not. Just say, I am not open-minded to the things of this world. I am closed-minded to the things of this world. My mind is for God, and it's for God's Word. And I, everything that goes in my mind is going to come through God's Word. Not to be conformed to the world. There are all these things, Christians. You need to behave as such, right? Are you behaving? By the way, I'm speaking to myself too. Am I behaving? You wonder why God gave it to me that way? Because He spoke to me first, church. Oh, I might have sounded like I was cracking a whip up here, right? Oh, I'm pointing people out or something, you know. I'm throwing fiery darts. No, that was God's Word speaking to my heart first. Am I behaving, Pastor Dennis? Do I conform to things of the world? Je you know, Jesus is asking me through His Word right there. Am I kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love? Do I give honor and preference to, to the others? Uh, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Do I rejoice in hope? Do I have patience in tribulations? Do I contend, continue steadfastly in prayer? Do I distribute these things to the needs of the saints? Amen? That's what we need to do as Christians. Distribute it. Are you behaving? Are you behaving? Hmm. You know, each and every week. Maybe you're, maybe you're saying to yourself, well, I'm not doing so well here, okay? Maybe, maybe you need to know Jesus Christ all over again. Maybe you need renew, recommit your life to the Lord. Maybe you've never committed your life to the Lord to begin with. You just like the, 
you like the coffee here. <laughs> you know, you like the little treats. Maybe, maybe your behavior isn't right because God's spirit isn't inside you yet. I want to give you that opportunity right now. I want to give you the opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you would be a child of God. And through that, each and everything in His Word would change your behavior. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. I'm going to say a little prayer. If you want to receive Jesus this morning, just pray along this line. Pray along this line. Say, Lord Jesus, I want you in my heart. Lord, I want to take you as my Lord and Savior. God, I know that you sent your Son. Put him upon that cross. You brought him to this world that he would die for my sins. Lord, I confess to you that I am a sinner and I am in need of a Savior. God, I want to receive you, Jesus. I want to receive you this very moment. Pour out your Spirit in me. God, change my behavior. Make me more like you, Jesus. Lord, I receive you this morning. Thank you. In Jesus' name.